In the last video, we finished by looking at the basic mechanism of hemolytic anemia. Any damage to the RBC causes it to be removed faster than normal via hemolysis, causing hemolytic anemia if this outpaces RBC production. In terms of our flow diagram, with production on the left, peripheral circulation in the middle, and removal on the right, this causes an increase in removal, leading to an overall decrease of RBCs. So we have a deficit of RBCs in the body, but the body begins to compensate. Production of new RBCs is ramped up in the bone marrow, leading to an overgrowth of RBC precursors in the bone marrow. This is termed erythroid hyperplasia, and it's visible under the microscope like this. You can tell just by looking that it looks hypercellular because of the increased amount of RBC precursors. Additionally, because there are so many RBC precursors, the number of reticulocytes, the immature stage of RBCs that normally make up just 1% of the circulating RBCs, increases as well. Since these escape into peripheral circulation, we see this clinically as an increase in reticulocytes, or to use our new terminology, reticulocytosis. This is helpful so we don't have to biopsy the bone marrow of every single patient in which we suspect erythroid hyperplasia. Unfortunately, the RBCs that are produced are diseased as well. So while the compensatory reaction by the body causes an increase in RBCs, it doesn't climb back to normal levels, and we still have anemia present. There are many causes of hemolytic anemia, but all of them have this in common. Something is wrong with the RBCs, causing them to hemolyze and be cleared from circulation faster than normal RBCs can be produced. We'll divide them into two broad categories. Intrinsic causes, which result from a deficit within the RBC itself, and extrinsic causes, which are caused by something affecting the RBC from outside. Let's start with the intrinsic causes. There are three of them, and they all end in apathies, to help you remember. We already know one category of intrinsic causes. The hemoglobin apathies we covered in the last video, sickle cell anemia and thalassemia. Both of these allow misformed hemoglobin to cause premature destruction of the RBC. But there are other intrinsic causes of hemolytic anemia as well. The first is the membranopathies. In this subset of diseases, the membrane of the RBC is malformed, which prevents the RBC from taking its normal biconcave shape. The resulting RBCs are more prone to hemolysis. There are two types of membranopathies, and the first is hereditary spherocytosis. The name suggests an excess of spheres, and that's exactly what we see on the blood smear, lots of sphere-like RBCs. These spherocytes, as they're called, impede blood flow through the spleen, damaging the RBCs and causing their rapid removal from circulation. A normal RBC is here in red, taking the normal donut-like shape, and the spherocytes are outlined here in blue. The other membranopathy is hereditary elliptocytosis. In this disease, the RBCs look like ellipses on the blood smear, and that's exactly what we see here, and they're called elliptocytes. Again, the malformed RBCs hemolyze and are cleared from circulation faster than they can be replaced. The final class of intrinsic causes of hemolytic anemia is the enzymopathies, in which defective enzymes inside the RBC cause its premature breakdown. The example we will be discussing is a deficiency of G6PD, or glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Thinking all the way back to biochemistry, G6PD is the first and rate-limiting enzyme along the hexose monophosphate shunt, taking in glucose 6-phosphate as its input. This pathway is responsible for regenerating NADPH within the RBC, and because red blood cells have no mitochondria, this is the only source they have for NADPH. Here we can see that two NADPHs are formed for each turn of the pathway. Recall that NADPH is used within the RBC to make reduced glutathione, which in turn is used to sequester any ROS species that pop up. Since RBCs carry oxygen around, they are at a substantial risk for ROS damage, and without the protective effects of glutathione via NADPH, the RBCs accrue a lot of damage and become less flexible. In G6PD deficiency, there's less NADPH and thus more ROS, which oxidizes excess hemoglobin to form insoluble Heinz bodies, as we can see in this picture of an RBC. This leads to premature destruction of the RBC via hemolysis, causing hemolytic anemia. G6PD deficiency is the most common human enzyme defect, although it seems to provide protection against malaria. Now let's move on to the extrinsic causes of hemolytic anemia. In these, the RBCs are normal and fully functional, but something extrinsic to them causes their premature destruction. There are many ways in which the RBCs can be damaged by outside causes, and we'll run through a few of them here. The first of these is known as immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, sometimes called autoimmune hemolytic anemia, which I will abbreviate IMHA. Let's examine this by looking at an RBC. In IMHA, the immune system responds to some antigens on the surface of the red blood cell, 
which I'll draw here in blue. And it does this by dispensing some antibodies, which I'll draw here in yellow, that particularly respond to this blue antigen. This causes the immune system to prematurely destroy the red blood cells, leading to hemolytic anemia. The exact cause of IMHA is unknown, but it can be tested for using the Coombs test, and here's how it works. Antibodies for the anti-RBC antigen, which I'll show here in green, are added to a sample of red blood cells. If the sample is positive, meaning that anti-RBC antigens are present, the blood will agglutinate, or clump. If the test is negative, the blood sample will not agglutinate, because there's no anti-RBC antibodies present. A positive test is suggestive of IMHA, but not diagnostic. A form of IMHA is also caused by the drug penicillin. The immune system responds to the presence of penicillin attached to the surface of the RBC, which causes immune-mediated destruction of the red blood cell. This leads to anemia. Another extrinsic cause of hemolytic anemia has a long name, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, but we'll just call it MAHA. In MAHA, abnormal clotting takes place in the small blood vessels in the body. So let's go ahead and draw in a blood vessel, and we'll use yellow to denote these little blood clots that form all over the place. And what happens is, as the red blood cells come through, which I'll draw here in red, they hit along these clots and they shear, and they break up and they form tiny little cells and fragments of cells called schistocytes, which you can see here in this picture. And I'll outline them in red. Here's a triangular one, and this one's kind of misshapen too. But because they're misshapen and damaged, they're rapidly cleared by the spleen, which leads to anemia. Two of the major causes of MAHA also have long names thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, or TTP, and disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC. There are other less common causes of hemolytic anemia, including malaria. The plasmodium protozoan that causes malaria lives part of its life cycle in the RBC. If these are destroyed in high enough numbers, hemolytic anemia results. Also, blood transfusions can cause hemolytic anemia. If a blood type other than your own is transfused into your body, your immune system will attack the foreign red blood cells, causing hemolytic anemia. The last cause is known as fetal RH incompatibility. This can develop if a mother is RH negative, but her child is RH positive. If the fetal and maternal blood were somehow to mix, the maternal immune system would make anti-RH antibodies. In future RH positive pregnancies, this anti-RH antibody can attack the RH antigen, causing hemolytic disease of the newborn, abbreviated HDN. The severity of the disease reflects how much maternal antigen is affecting the fetus. Fortunately, this is treatable with the drug Rogam, which sensitizes the mother's immune system to Rh-positive antigens for the duration of her pregnancy. So how does a patient with hemolytic anemia present? Well, let's first review our disease mechanism to make a prediction. In all cases, hemolytic anemia is caused by premature hemolysis or destruction of RBCs. This may be for a number of reasons. Malformed RBCs, the hemoglobinopathies and membranopathies cause this, inability to manage oxidative stress due to the enzymopathies, autoimmune causes as in IMHA and in penicillin, abnormal clotting as in MAHA, malaria, blood transfusions, or fetal RH incompatibility. In all of these cases, the RBCs are prematurely destroyed, leading to hemolytic anemia. What would this cause in a patient? As the RBCs are broken down, they release their hemoglobin, which is converted into bilirubin for excretion in the urine. This can cause jaundice and can turn the urine a dark brown color. Some of the excess hemoglobin binds haptoglobin, a protein in the blood that binds hemoglobin to prevent it from causing oxidative damage. Thus, these patients have decreased haptoglobin since much of it is bound to the excess of hemoglobin present. Additionally, since the spleen is working extra hard to clear the excess of damaged RBCs, the spleen swells in size. Splenomegaly is a classic sign indicating hemolytic anemia. The excess production of RBCs also leads to the presence of more reticulocytes, which spill out into the blood and are visible on a peripheral blood smear. As we mentioned before, a positive Coombs test indicates an abnormal immune process, and the blood smear can give additional info as well. The presence of spherocytes, elliptocytes, or schistocytes can indicate the specific type of hemolytic anemia present.